Well, thank you for that very kind introduction and that very kind welcome. It's always a pleasure to be back in Atlanta. Like a politician, I have many, many places I can call my hometown, and uh, this is certainly uh, uh, one of them, having lived here in the, uh, in the 1970s. Um, I also have family members here. I'm sorry that my wife couldn't come this year. She was down here when I gave this talk, uh, a talk here last year. Uh, but other members of my family are, uh, are in the audience and perhaps some old friends as well. What I'm going to do tonight, I, I want to talk for a couple of minutes. I'm going to read a couple of different uh, selections, short ones mainly, from the novel uh, Palace Council. Then I have a few more comments I want to make, and then I'll take questions that, um, uh, that you might have. But before I do any reading, I, I do want to comment on something that became obvious, uh, if you didn't already know it, from what you just heard from some of the uh, advanced comment about the book. Uh, like my first two novels, this one is a, uh, a thriller wrapped around a mystery, but um, unlike the first two, it doesn't take place in the present age. It takes place uh, in the 1960s. Now, it begins in the mid-1950s and ends in the mid-1970s. And you might say, how can all that be the 60s? But a few of you may, like me, be old enough to remember the 60s. And if you are, you know that they were, they felt about 20 years long. <laughs> um, there are a lot of reasons that I chose to set a story in the uh, 1960s. Some of them are technical reasons related to my writing style. I always start with characters I want to write about. Um, and then I have to find a story for them. And if any of you read uh, my novel, New England White, um, which was told mainly from the point of view of the protagonist, um, a young, uh, well, a woman who worked at a divinity school. She was deputy dean of a divinity school named Julia Carlyle. You might remember that she had this very domineering mother who was a very famous psychologist, retired from teaching. And I began to wonder, as I finished that novel, um, what her mother's life was like, what had created her. No, she's not a major character in this novel, but she's a character in this novel. I, was try I began by thinking about her world, and that began to generate a larger uh, story. The other character I began with that I wanted to write about was Richard Nixon. Um, Nixon, to me, has always been uh, one of the most fascinating characters uh, in American political history. Uh, he was uh, simultaneously a, a scoundrel and a brilliant politician, which is a not unknown uh, combination. Uh, but what, what the, the thing about Nixon that fascinates me always is that, that Nixon, I think, um, in interesting ways, represented something that runs very deep in the American character. And although I love my country very dearly, um, there is an aspect of the character that frightens me, and this is across the political spectrum, and that is our love of winners and winning. Um, and Nixon was a man who knew how to win. And that was, in a sense, the only thing he knew how to do. He knew winning. Um, we, um, we admire winners. We love them. We put them on the covers of magazines. We nearly worship them. And we never ask how they won unless someone, usually a journalist, rubs our nose in it. And then we say, he was taking steroids? I thought he was born with those muscles or something, <laughs> uh, some, something like that. We're always quite astonished. Uh, and Nixon epitomized that in part because he knew how to win and in part because he w kept coming back. Um, Nixon um, was a man, I, I think, of, of actually very few actual political convictions other than winning. It's not that he tilted with the winds, it's that he always had a new idea about a new position to take in order to win. And so, for example, uh, the Nixon of the novel uh, is a liberal in civil rights in the 1950s, as Nixon actually was. Um, Nixon was liberal in civil rights. Um, he may have, these convictions may have been sincere, I don't know, but, but the histories suggest that the reason for his convictions uh, was trying to break up the New Deal coalition and get black people to vote Republican again. And so, for example, when the uh, Dixiecrats, the Southern Democrats, controlled the United States Senate and would not bring to a vote either the two top priorities of the civil rights leaders in the 50s, a voting rights bill and an anti-lynching bill, it was Nixon who went to Eisenhower and suggested the Republicans sponsor them instead, pointing out that with Eisenhower's prestige, they could break the logjam in the Senate. The argument Nixon made to Eisenhower was that Black people begin to vote Republican again, and he said that the Democrats wouldn't win another election until the end of the uh, of the century, and Eisenhower um, wouldn't go along. 
And so that actually happened. That doesn't make Nixon into some great progressive. It means it's an example of him having a theory about how to win. That one didn't work. He came up with another one. And so in 1968, he came up with the so-called Southern Strategy, which is more important than people may remember because when Eisenhower was beating Adlai Stevenson by a landslide in uh, 52 and 56 in the elections, we think of Stevenson as the liberal and Eisenhower as the conservative, but Stevenson carried only the South. He carried only the South, and he carried the entire South. In those two elections combined, I believe he carried one state outside, uh, uh, outside the South. So Nixon looks at the map and says, if we break up the solid South, we win, and that led to the anti-busing rhetoric of the 1968 presidential uh, uh, campaign. We go on and on. There's a lot of stories like that to show how we went back and forth, thinking of what it took uh, to win. That was why it fascinated me. And then the idea of the 60s also, if you think of the era, not only of Nixon, the era of the Kennedys, the era of King, the era of King, the assassinations, the protests, the uh, political violence from the right, the political violence uh, from the left the rise of any number of movements that have changed America or some issues we're still fighting about. To me, it's an irresistible decade, and the idea of setting a thriller uh, in that decade uh, also seemed to me uh, very powerful because there were so many strands going on. You could pluck at any two or three of them, and you've got a, uh, you, you've got a story. So that's some of why I decided to write about uh, uh, that era. So yes, for those of you who read one or both of my first two novels, no, we're not in the little college town of Elm Harbor anymore. We're in a larger stage. This one takes place in uh, New York City, in Washington, um, in London, uh, in Saigon, and in a number of other uh, settings as well, uh, all of them set uh, in the period from mid-50s to the uh, mid-70s. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read you uh, tonight, um, hoping to whet your appetite for more, a, an edited version of the prologue when I say edited, because not everything that's written down is written to be read effectively aloud, so that's what we, why writers tend to edit when we read. Uh, an edited version of the prologue, a tiny sliver, two paragraphs of chapter one, and an edited version of a part of chapter uh, four. So this is the, the prologue to uh, Palace Council, hoping to whet your appetite. The lawyer was nervous, and that was odd. His hands trembled on the steering wheel, and that was odder still. He had learned in the war that there was no sin in being afraid as long as the others never knew. He understood that courage was a discipline, as was confidence. In the marble caverns of Wall Street, the lawyer intimidated all around him with his breadth of knowledge and speed of mind. In the boardrooms of his clients, he had no equal. On his rare forays into the courtroom, he charmed the judges with his wit and persuaded them with his force. He had commanded a company of rangers in North Africa and Europe. He provided his adoring wife and children with a house in the suburbs equipped with every modern convenience. It was the summer of 1952, the era of such men as himself. The United States was about to elect a military man its president. The nation's steelmakers had just crushed a nationwide strike. The Congress was about to add the words under God to the Pledge of Allegiance. American science had invented a way to phone from California to New York without using an operator. Some people insisted on calling attention to the nation's imperfections, but the lawyer believed in quiet progress, quiet, gradual progress. The nation would move forward in its good time. So calm down, he commanded himself, annoyed to discover that he was drumming his fingers on the dash. He tightened his grip on the wheel. The driveway was full of cars. The house was long and low. Golden light spilled invitingly from the windows. Still the lawyer hesitated. August air, loamy and rich, drifted into the car. Clouds hid the moon, but the forecasted rain had yet to arrive. The lawyer glanced at the glowering sky and endured a shivering premonition of death. Fighting his growing unease, the lawyer focused his mind on the image of his wife's glowing face. He shut his eyes and listened to her teasing South Carolina drawl calmer now, he reminded himself why he was here. Dinner and conversation, his host had said, smiling over coffee in Manhattan. And stag only, no wives. Why no wives, the lawyer had asked, not unreasonably. Trust me. The lawyer had been too savvy to press. His host knew people, and the kind of people he knew, knew other people. When his host mentioned the names of some of the others who were expected to attend, the lawyer was hooked. He 
climbed out of the car. Laughter wafted from the house, and beneath it music scratchy and low. The lawyer practiced his courtroom smile. About to ring the bell, he noticed a much younger man standing at ease on the grass, his face in shadow, his smooth hair pale and bright in the light from within. Odd. No aides, tonight's host had insisted. No drivers. No bodyguards. And this in a crowd whose members tended to possess several of each. The lawyer rang, then turned to the stranger to say hello. But the blonde man had vanished so thoroughly into the inky darkness that the lawyer began to doubt whether he had seen him at all. Never mind. Focus. Scintillate. Intimidate. The door swung open. The lawyer stepped inside. When he emerged, it was well past four in the morning. He was dizzy from lack of sleep and too much good food and excellent claret. He was among the last to leave. Their host had worked out a departure schedule according to some scheme none of them understood. And yet they did as he proposed, accepting without a murmur of complaint his insistence on security against threats he refused to disclose. The lawyer stood beside his car, fingers touching the door without quite opening it. The dew made the surface shine. He was shivering harder now than he had been on arrival and not from cold. The host had unveiled his plan, and it turned out to be like the man himself, brilliant, complex, efficient. The lawyer had sat there with the others, the whole room entranced as their host strode up and down in front of the fire, eyes bright and alive, filling in some details, leaving others for later discovery. One by one, the men at dinner had nodded. Some of the most powerful men in the country, and they had all nodded. Yes, yes, and yes again. They were on board. The lawyer had nodded along with the rest, but his nod had been a lie. The lawyer thought the plan, for all its brilliance, was evil. There was no other word. The plan might even accomplish its ends. Many evil plans did. The lawyer had seen enough of life to know that the triumph of good was anything but inevitable. The triumph of good in the last war had cost the world millions of souls. The lawyer slipped behind the wheel. He knew what his wife would say. She was a wonderful woman, but she had been pampered and sheltered all her life. She did not understand how in the world of men, sometimes you had to sup with the devil, at least for a while, in order to... Did you need anything, sir? The lawyer turned, startled. The blonde man was leaning close, smiling politely through the open window. He had crept up on the car without giving the smallest hint of his approach. Even in the rangers, the lawyer had known no one as stealthy. The lawyer started to answer, then hesitated. The cobalt eyes said that the blonde man knew his every thought. The gaze was at once pitying and spiritless, the gaze of an executioner. I'm fine, the lawyer said after his stomach finished twisting and turning. Fine, thank you. Good meeting? Oh, yes, absolutely. Travel safely, sir. I will. Thanks again. Driving off, the lawyer felt a flooding relief as if he had escaped from hell. His murder was still 30 months away. So that's the prologue. Oh, you like that? <laughs> okay. All right. It's been a nice evening. Bye. Uh, um, that's the prologue. And, it, and it's a, so it introduces some of the elements and obviously the thriller mystery element, but it is also a love story. And in Chapter 1, I introduce um, my two protagonists, uh, Eddie Wesley and Aurelia Treen. Uh, Eddie Wesley uh, being a young man whose father is involved in the civil rights movement, who comes to Harlem hoping to be a writer, or really being the woman he falls in love with, who's come to Harlem basically uh, looking for a wealthy man uh, to marry. <laughs> um, Eddie is not a wealthy man. Uh, I'm going to read you just the very beginning of that chapter, really just the first couple of paragraphs, to set the stage a bit about who they are. And then I'm going to tell you a couple of things, little bits and pieces, and then read you another short selection. Had Eddie Wesley been a less reliable man, he would never have stumbled over the body, chased Junie to Tennessee, battled the devils to a draw, and helped to topple a president. But Eddie was blessed or perhaps cursed with a dependability that led to a lack of prudence in pursuing his devotion. He loved only two women in his life, loved them both with a recklessness that often made him a difficult man to like. 
and thus was able, when the moment arrived, to save the country he had come to hate. A more prudent man might have failed. As for Aurelia, she arrived with her own priorities, very conventional, very American, and so from the start, very different from Eddie's. Once they went their separate ways, there was no earthly reason to suppose the two of them would join forces, even after the events of that fateful Palm Sunday and what happened in Hong Kong. But join they did, by necessity more than choice, fighting on alone when everybody else had quit or died. Almost everybody. Now those are my two uh, protagonists. Uh, and in chapter one, uh, I'm going to just pick out a couple of events. Two important events happen. One is uh, Aurelia decides to marry someone else. Um, she marries, um, she decides to marry a man named Kevin Garland. Uh, if you, the name sounds familiar to you, if you read my first novel, The Emperor of Ocean Park, and you remember Judge Oliver Garland, who of course died in the first sentence of that novel. <laughs> but, the, but the novel's about him nevertheless. Kevin is his cousin. Ke Kevin is his cousin. She decides to marry Kevin. Um, Eddie goes to the uh, uh, engagement party trying to do the right thing. And, uh, but he can't stand it. He stalks out uh, into the snow. It's by then February of 1955. And he, um, and angrily stalking around across the street from the party, stumbles over a body, uh, which turns out to be the body of the uh, Wall Street lawyer you met in the prologue. Uh, his name is Philmont Castle, or Phil to his friends. Um, and meanwhile, and so Eddie, Eddie th that, that event, stumbling over that body, uh, launches Eddie, in a sense, on a 20-year quest, what turns out to be a 20-year quest, to understand certain things about um, that death and what else it might imply. But meanwhile, I want to talk to you for a few minutes about, or read you a few minutes about uh, Aurelia, who, by the way, is my favorite character in the book. Aurelia had known life with a Garland would be different, but had no idea just how different. Kevin Garland was nine years her senior, an executive at his father's small investment firm, with lovely smile, a warm sense of humor, and considerable liquid assets. One evening during their courtship, Kevin said he had a surprise for her. They took a taxi to a fancy hotel on Central Park South, the sort of place Negroes dared not enter, even in the absence of a formal color bar. Kevin crossed the lobby as if he owned it. They rode the elevator to a suite overlooking the park. A pair of guards stood before the door. Inside, Kevin introduced Aurelia to Richard Nixon, the Vice President of the United States. Nixon made an awkward fuss over her. He told her that the Garlands were wonderful people, that they were in the front rank in the fight against the Red Menace. He clapped and embarrassed Kevin on the back and pronounced him a future leader of the Negro people. Nixon was in the city to address the United Nations, where America at this time was feared and envied, but not yet hated. He had a sad, shy, jowly face, a flat-footed walk, and a way of dropping his head without hunching his shoulders and still watching you. He smiled like a man not sure just why. We don't want to take too much of your time, sir, said Kevin. Your husband's a hero, said the vice president, waggling a finger. One day the story will come out. He's not my husband, said Aurelia. Seeing Kevin's crestfallen face, she felt constrained to add, not yet. Well, hold on to him. He's rich. <laughs> the vice president was famously not rich. His suit was relentlessly inexpensive. A few years earlier, I'm sorry, a few years earlier, he had deflected an influence peddling scandal by assuring the nation in a televised address that his wife, Pat, wore a cheap cloth coat. And a good man. This is Nixon again. Remember that. Thank you, I will. Hear great things about you. About me? Call me right, fans everywhere. The shy smile as an aide appeared to say it was time for the vice president to depart. Shaking their hands, he reminded Kevin to call him any time he needed a favor. There's only one favor we need, Kevin said. Later, Aurelia was adamant that Kevin had said, we. Nixon's smile faded. None of my people have turned up a clue. We'd be grateful if you would keep looking, sir. I'll do what I can. Out on the street afterward, Kevin raised a hand. A blocky yellow cab stopped at once. No Negro could get a taxi in midtown Manhattan, especially at night. Everybody knew that. But for elegant Kevin Garland, the rules were different. Heading downtown, Aurelia asked how he knew Nixon. Through my father. What did he mean about me having fans everywhere? I write gossip in a tiny newspaper. 
Kevin grinned. Dick's a politician. It's his job to flatter you. I couldn't do a job like that. Don't I know it? Meaning what, she asked, ready to get hot. Meaning you're not much of a flatterer. His grin widened. But I guess I don't need much flattery. I do my own. <laughs> I really let this pass. I heard what you and Nixon were talking about. Mm -hmm. What's he looking for? What's the big secret? He used to do business with my father. Her eyes sparkled at this intelligence. How does your father know him? Nixon. Kevin was a long time answering. Remember the big scandal back in 52 when Nixon was accused of having a secret slush fund to smear his opponents, paid for by a bunch of his millionaire friends from California? No, said Aurelia truthfully. He patted her hand. Well, not all the millionaires were white. So she marries Kevin Garland. Uh, they have a big wedding. Uh, and then the following events occur. The honeymoon was a six-week European tour. The loving couple stayed in the suites at the finest hotels in London, Paris, and Rome, cities she knew only from picture books borrowed from the library. They also visited towns she never heard of in Tuscany in the south of France. Kevin knew people everywhere. The hotels treated him like royalty. For a week, they were inseparable. Then the strangeness began. Men drew her husband aside for whispered conversations in hotel lobbies, and afterward, he would look grim. Envelopes were delivered to their room, and Kevin would shake his head and sulk for hours. Now and then, he would kiss her gently and say he had to go out for a while, then vanish into the starry night and not reappear sometimes until morning, cold, sober, and looking worried. He apologized, but never gave account of himself except to say it was business. Ori had not been trained for this role. She did not know whether to ignore his transgressions, reproach him, or offer to help. One night in Paris, Aurelia decided to follow him, but the doorman took so long to find her a cab that Kevin got away. Only later did it occur to her that the man's seeming incompetence had been prearranged. In Athens, she managed to grab a cab out of rank, but when her driver realized into what, which corner of the city her target was vanishing, he refused to take her any further. Aurelia went back. When Kevin walked into the suite at 3 in the morning, his wife was prepared to give him a really hard time, but he showed no signs of dishevelment, and later when their activities gave her the opportunity to inspect her husband's body, she found no, tale to no telltale to suggest that he had been with another woman. The next evening, to make amends, Kevin arranged a private tour of the Acropolis after it had been closed to tourists. The guide told him how the entire adult male population of Athens, thousands and thousands of men, used to assemble here to vote on important decisions. For some reason, Kevin grew annoyed and distant once more. In the car on the way back to the hotel, he told her that the problem with democracy was that everybody was entitled to a say. <laughs> Their final stop was London, and that was where Kevin left her alone for three days, this time warning her in advance and explaining patiently as she threw a poorly aimed hairbrush that it could not be helped. The staff of the Dorchester would meet her every whim, he said. When she threatened to return to the States, Kevin dropped his eyes. You can do that. The concierge will fix your ticket, but I need you here. Need me? You're leaving me alone. I mean, I need you here, in this suite. I'm sorry, honey. I can't trust anybody else just now. He kissed her. After this, it's over. I promise. He did not say what it was. Aurelia stayed and seethed, shopping recklessly and having the bills sent back to the hotel. But she always hurried back because Kevin had said he needed her in the suite. On the third evening, the porter appeared with a large envelope, tightly sealed. Kevin's name was on the outside. To Ori's surprise, she was required to sign for it. She put the envelope on the dresser. If Kevin was not back by lunch, she would open it herself. But Kevin was back at the Dorchester by breakfast. He slipped into the suite behind the waiter. This envelope came for you, she said. Good, he said, and kissed her. He picked it up and glanced at the flap. Did you open it? No. Kevin looked at her. I didn't, honey. He just kept staring. She thought she would scream. Where did you go, she finally asked. What have you been doing? Can't you tell me? Kevin sighed and shook his head, his delicate face pinched with exhaustion. Phil left a mess behind. Phil Castle? He did business with my father's firm. In Athens? In Tuscany? Her husband barely heard. He was riffling through the pages from the envelope. It's a long story, Kevin said, and she knew he would never tell it and regretted what he had said already. In bed that night, when she reached for her husband, he turned away. An awkward silence, and then, always feisty, Aurelia asked what was wrong. 
The honeymoon is over, he said. Is it me? Don't be silly. A longer interlude, or really wishing you would at least turn and face her in the darkness. Did you find it? Find what? Whatever you were looking for. Not yet, he said, and slept. The next day they embarked for New York aboard the Queen Mary in the Winston Churchill suite, second finest on the ship. Kevin spent the voyage in the telegraph room exchanging cryptic and very expensive messages with his father. Aurelia spent the voyage wondering whom she had married. Now, the one other thing I'll tell you is that Aurelia did tell a little white lie to her husband. She actually had read the letter, as you might have guessed. <laughs> and this is what it said. The letter itself began oddly, Dear Author, as if to a writer or a magazine. Dear Author, all interrogations were negative. All sources have been unproductive. The testament is likely on your side of the water. Kindly inform our mutual friend that the debt is paid. We can offer no further assistance. The letter was unsigned. She crawled into bed and lay awake waiting for morning. She tossed and turned, wondering. Her husband was receiving secret unsigned notes from people who could perform interrogations and had sources and used words like unproductive. People who helped the author because of a debt owed to a mutual friend. He had dragged his new bride around Europe in search of a testament that was probably back in the States. A testament, the sort of thing people left behind when they died. Now, after her husband's return, Ori, Ori understood a little more. Phil left a mess behind, Kevin had told, her exhaustion making him indiscreet. But a mess evidently was not all Castle had left. He had also left some kind of testament. And whatever the testament might be, Kevin Garland was desperate to find it. So I'll stop there. That's all the reading part that I'm going to do, <laughs> hoping that I've whetted your appetite. Um, I, I do want to tell you, I'm going to tell you a couple more things, um, points about the story that in a general way they don't give anything away. And then I want to answer a couple of the most common questions I've had on my book tour, and then I'll take other questions uh, that you have, although I hope unlike a certain unfortunate incident I had in New York, it will be questions and not speeches that you want to, uh, to make about the era and so on. Um, anyway, uh, the point is that, 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 that Aurelia and Eddie go their separate ways, uh, and he um, ends up working in the Kennedy administration. He ends up being radicalized by the war in Vietnam. Um, becomes a major figure on the American left. Uh, she goes back to graduate school, gets her PhD, and eventually becomes a professor. Um, in their different ways, they both begin to suspect uh, that behind a number of the events that have brushed against their lives and, and touched larger portions of America, uh, there's something larger uh, going on. And uh, uh, as I suppose is, is uh, de rigueur with a, a thriller, as the bodies begin to pile up, the reader begins to get a sense of the shape of the uh, conspiracy, if there is one, too. Um, let me answer a couple of, three of the questions I've gotten most commonly on this book tour, and then I'll, I'll, uh, I'll answer your questions. Uh, the first one I want to answer, uh, which comes up at every stop, is uh, since I've written now three thrillers, and they're all about conspiracies, am I a conspiracy theorist? And uh, the answer is no. Most of the things that happen that I disapprove of, I think happen because well-meaning people often with very bad views, um, make terrible mistakes. And that's what I think that's, it's, you don't need a conspiracy to explain very much, I think. Um, but in fiction, they are so much fun to write about. <laughs> because you know how much of a story of a hero says, boy, those people are incompetent. But boy, those people are malevolent. And they're out to get me. And my friends and my family and every witness is dying. See, then you have a story, you see. So conspiracies work really well in, uh, in, in fiction. Uh, the second question, people asked about um, historical research, uh, and I did a lot of it. Um, first of all, there are a number of, of, of people who either are major characters in the story or who brush against the story who really existed. You've heard about uh, Richard Nixon I mentioned before. Langston Hughes is a major character in the first half of the book. He can't be a major character in the second half of the book because he died in 1967. Um, um, John Kennedy is briefly in the book because Eddie works in the Kennedy administration. Joseph Kennedy, his father, plays a somewhat larger role uh, uh, in the story. Uh, J. Edgar Hoover is involved in the story. And I have to say of J. Edgar Hoover that 
in, in crafting my character, I said I did a lot of research, I did a lot of reading, a lot of listening, a lot of looking. I tried to craft characters who were in some sense full, even if they uh, are only on the pages for a few minutes. I wanted to make people of some complexity, which means that most people have something redeeming um, about them. Um, someone said the portraits are sympathetic, and maybe they are, um, but they're certainly full. The one person I couldn't do that with was J. Edgar Hoover. I couldn't find... <laughs> You know, I, I, it, was not for, it was not for lack of trying. I read, a bio, I, I read a serious biography of Hoover. I read a number of very serious works of fiction and just no, uh, uh, I'm sorry, of history uh, about the period. And, and no one has just, I, I couldn't find any suggestion of qualities that would make him an interesting character who you'd want to learn more about. They just weren't there. Um, so it's a shabby blackmailer in the book instead, you know. That's just because I just couldn't. Uh, but that's, that's not what I like to do. I like to write people of, you know, Robert Musil, a person with qualities I like, and, and, uh, but Hoover didn't have any. Um, uh, so that's just, at least that I could find. If someone has some to suggest, maybe I could do another novel with him as the, <laughs> as the hero or something um, like that. Um, but the other thing is that, so in doing the research, what I tried to do was, uh, there's a lot of dialogue I had to invent, but I tried at least to make it plausible that if the people involved had done some of the things I said or been involved in some of these things, that this is the sort of thing they would have said. A lot of times I moved dialogue around. There's a number of passages of Nixon's where I took material uh, from speeches or press conferences or offhand comments he'd made later and put it earlier because we don't have very good sources um, that ha or have dialogue from him in the mid-1960s and, uh, and, and so on. Um, I also, uh, there are a number of historical events weaved into it, including one event that, one um, reviewer, I'm told, uh, thought was implausible, didn't think it could have happened. Uh, there's a scene in the novel um, after, the, uh, after the National Guard killed the four unarmed uh, anti-war demonstrators at Kent State in 1970, what was then, a few days later, what was up to that time the largest anti-war demonstration in history was held on the Mall. Uh, and in the story, in, in the novel, the night before that demonstration, um, Nixon leaves the White House, nobody but a couple of Secret Service agents with him, and drives over to the mall and wakes up the students because he wants to talk to them and just try to persuade them he's a nice guy and we have disagreements, but actually I'm a likable guy and I have a reasonable point of view and so on. And he talks to them out there, and of course that really happened. Nixon really did uh, do that, and he really did after that drive up to Capitol Hill and sit at his old congressional desk after he found somebody to open the uh, the door and begin to tell stories to his growing entourage because various White House people kept trying to try to get him to come back. Uh, about his days in the Congress. Now those are the best days of his life. And then um, he really did have, have uh, a show at the Mayflower Hotel in front of startled early morning tourists and to have breakfast uh, like the way he used to when he was in uh, Congress. All that really happened. He really did do all that stuff, and that's irresistible to put in a story like this. On the other hand, there are other historical events that I moved around um, a lot. And there's a very long author's note. If you've read my other novels, you know I write long author's notes. This one's even longer than the rest of them. You said, yes, you, you remember that? But it's because, because I'm trained as a scholar before I, I started writing fiction in a serious way. Um, I, I'm trained to try to get my facts right. And so I want to let you know when I know I got my facts wrong, but people tell me it really was overkill this time. And maybe it, uh, <laughs> maybe it was. Like I have a note in there that I moved Richard Nixon's pardon two weeks earlier than it actually occurred and things like that. But I did. I mean, I wanted to tell you that I really knew when it uh, had happened. <laughs> Um, the third question uh, that, that I've gotten that I'll just mention, and then I'll take your questions, the third and final one. Um, since I've written uh, seven nonfiction books and now three novels, people ask me, which one is harder, um, uh, writing fiction, writing nonfiction? And for me, writing fiction is much harder. It is no comparison, no comparison. Writing nonfiction is, is itself hard, but it has its own discipline. It's something I've learned over the years how to do. You might think I do it well or poorly, but I know the process. I know the technique of doing it. Writing fiction, I am unable to turn fiction into, into a technique. Uh, and so for me, it is enormously draining, emotionally, psychologically, sometimes physically. Um, maybe it's, some people say, do I get too involved with the characters? Am I just undisciplined? I don't know what it is. But, uh, but, I, but I find writing fiction both obsessive and exhausting at the same time. Uh, so it's, it's for me much, much harder. Anyway, so let me take questions that you uh, might have, questions or or comments, but is it preferably not too many of the uh, of the speeches? Yours, Miss, back there, and then I'll take yours. Yes, go ahead.
<laughs> oh, well, I don't know about uniquely, but yeah, uh, the, question, the question was about an interview I had at NPR earlier this week uh, where I talked about, what I was actually talking about was um, why so many lawyers and law professors, when they turn to fiction, end up writing thrillers. Why is that? And I, 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 have a, I guess I didn't, share, maybe I didn't share my theory last year. If I did, if you were here last year, please indulge me for sharing again. I do have a theory about that. Ask yourself, what is it that everybody hates about lawyers? Well, there's a lot of things people hate about lawyers. But let me tell you one, <laughs> one thing in particular. One thing in particular people hate about lawyers is this. You come into some unexpected money, and you go to see your lawyer, and you say, Joe, I say, I want to leave this money to my kids. I want to change my will. And you figure you'll be out of there in five minutes. And Laura says, have you thought about this? Have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Have you thought about that? Oh, no, 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 no. And, and, but you know, that's what we train lawyers to do. From the first day of law school, when I am interrogating my contracts, first-year students, with one hypothetical after another, they think they have the answer, but what about this? The real skill that lawyers have that most people don't, it's not reading cases or statutes. If you work hard, you can do that. It's anticipating and imagining contingencies. Think of what might happen that we haven't thought about yet. Isn't that what a thriller is? You, know, you get to the end of a chapter, what might happen next? Have you thought about this? What about if that happened? That's exactly the, kind, the way that lawyers are trained to think. So I think it's very natural that, um, uh, that lawyers, uh, a lot of lawyers, not all, turn to um, thrillers and sometimes mysteries uh, when they start writing. Yes, sir. And then If Nixon had not been caught or stopped or resigned, what's the worst he could have done? Is that the question? Oh, I don't know. I think he probably would have left office. And this is what I think would have happened. I think he would have left office. Maybe the Democrats don't win in 76. I'm not sure. But I think he would have gone into retirement and written these learned tomes about what a great statesman he – oh, he did do that. Wait a minute. That's <laughs> – <laughs> but I mean, I, I mean, I'm not sure – I, I, I take your point, and I'm glad he was caught and stopped. But I think the difference in history, I think it's, I think it's a blip in history. It's not a mountain uh, in history. He needed to be stopped, but the truth is well, there's a lot of people we don't stop. There's a lot of people we don't catch. And some of them are probably people we really admire. Some are probably people we really hate, you know. Um, and I, I, history would have been different in some respects. Um, if, I, I, the biggest difference, I think, if, if he doesn't resign and the Republicans win in 76, we may not have the Reagan Revolution in 80 quite so soon because you needed years, at least four years of Democratic rule to have the Reagan Revolution. If the Democrats win, I think Reagan might win anyway in 1980, whoever the Democrat, whether it would be President Carter or someone else. I don't know that. I'm, I'm guessing. I'm, look, I'm not even good at predicting election, you know, things that are going to happen in, in a week or two. I still, I thought Michael Dukakis was going to win by a landslide in 1988. <laughs> so, you know, I'm not really a person to ask about these things. I said, there's was a hand over here. I'll get, yes. Do I see any similarities between Nixon and the current uh, uh, George Bush? Um, I, it's, it, you know, in, in spite of the political appeal, the question not a question that's really answerable in a sense. Um, I, I, that, that successful politicians in the end tend to be people who are deeply devoted to winning. They tend not to be ideological. Even someone like Reagan, who was deeply devoted to winning, was only ideological as campaigning. Other than on the issue of taxes, he was not particularly ideological in his governing. Um, and, and, and so successful politicians have a similarity to them. And the similarity is they learn how to do what they have to do um, in order to win. No, I think Nixon, what's interesting about Nixon to me, the other half of Nixon, I mean, uh, Bush came from a, a well-established political dynasty and he had money, and Nixon came from nothing. And there's a long tradition in American politics of, of this back and forth. There are eras when we have presidents who came from money and, and background and so on, Kennedy, Roosevelt, for example, and there are times when you have presidents who really came from nothing. Um, who the tradition of the self-made man is, in a sense, very much alive in the in the tradition of of, uh, uh, of presidents. There was a hint. Yes. yes. Well, 
let, let me make clear that although I have a lot of black middle class characters in my novels, I'm, I'm trying to write entertainment. I'm trying to write thrillers. I'm not trying to write anthropology or something like that. Um, but actually, th there are a lot of, of novelists over the years who've set novels in which major characters um, have been middle class educated people. They just haven't tended to get a lot of, of publicity. In fact, uh, Toni Morrison has had, had at least two of her novels, for example, set. She does get a lot of publicity, but, but there are others who, um, um, who haven't, who have, who have um, written fiction uh, that's been set. Some of Langston Hughes' fiction, uh, especially some of his short stories, for example, uh, you'd find um, set, set in that um, uh, milieu. And there have been some others uh, as well, especially back in the 1920s and, uh, and 1930s. But if you're talking about the current fiction market, I think you're largely right. And if one of the effects of the success of my fiction is that more publishers will look at a broader variety of works from black authors who want to write, then I, I'd be delighted if that were to um, uh, if that were to occur. We'll see if it happens, but if that were to occur, I think that would be a wonderful thing. Now, there was a hand. I was going back and forth. Wait, you had your turn already. Well, you never <laughs> Okay, I think was your hand up? It was a hand was up before, and I'm going to get go with that side. Yes, please go ahead, right there. Um, since it's hard to write fiction, um, why do I keep doing it and who are my influences? <laughs> I ask myself that question. My wife asks me that question um, uh, as well. You know, I never read my, any of my books. I've never read one of my books after it's all finished. I've never sat down and read one uh, cover to cover. Uh, after it was um, uh, finished, um, and so it's not that I like you know living through it or something um, or something like that. I, I don't know what it is. I, I, I suppose maybe fiction appeals to something different in in my obsessive need to write, because I do have a need to write. Um, uh, Richard Posner, who is a federal judge who apparently writes more opinions than any federal judge, turns out one and usually two books each year, and also writes more law review articles than all but a handful of, of legal scholars every year, he was once asked in an interview um, how he stayed so productive. And he said, writing is my only hobby. He said, when I have nothing to do, I sit down and start to write something. And while I wouldn't put myself in a productivity class with Richard Posner, I do uh, sort of share that view that I find myself constantly drawn back to uh, my laptop, to my notebook. I carry these notebooks around um, pretty much everywhere I go, um, these little brown, brown leather uh, Notebooks, Barnes and Noble, 1795. Um, <laughs> other people sell them too, but this, I just noticed the sticker on the back. Um, and I take notes for things. Most of them I'll never turn into anything, but I always have a bunch of writing projects going. Um, so right now um, on my hard drive and also on you know flash memory cards, I have probably three or four nearly completed novels and pieces of at least six or seven more. Will I ever be able to finish any of them? I don't know, because one of the things the obsessive character of my fiction writing causes is a lack of stick to -itiveness. I'm always switching from one project to uh, another. I'm surprised I was able to finish the ones that I, uh, that I have. But from the time I was small, I always wanted to write. I always liked writing. I always wanted to write something. My brothers are here tonight. They could tell you that I was always obsessively um, writing. I think I actually copied something from my older brother, who also used to obsessively write when we were uh, uh, when we were uh, uh, young, I just I liked doing it. And when I, when I had was involved in student organizations, whether in high school or college or law school, the ones I really got heavily involved with tended to be ones where I could write. Um, when I was an undergraduate, um, I was a columnist for the campus paper for three years, and I was also the managing editor my my um, senior year. Um, I loved the writing. I never liked reporting. I never liked the interviewing part, but the writing, the putting words on the page. I really feel like that's the only really practical skill uh, that I have, and I'm hoping that it's a skill to be practical for another couple of generations. Anyway, but that's the only real practical skill that I have is putting words on a page, and I just, um, I'm drawn to do it. I'm not always drawn to do it through fiction. I'm just always drawn to, uh, to do it. Now there was a hand over here. Let me get yours right there, and I'll take the one two down from, yes. My last three books were all nonfiction, were all fiction. I'm sorry, I made the same. Uh, uh, when can we expect some uh, nonfiction? Possibly next year. Um, I have two nonfiction projects I've been working on for a long time. One is a, um, a book, really, that would 
is going to be with the university press for scholars, but it's, it's a small book about some, some theoretical problems in, in um, uh, the ethics, uh, what you might call the ethics, the law and ethics of war, uh, which is a field in which I teach um, and write. But I also have been working on a book. I gave a talk, I gave a talk at the Library of Congress about four years ago about why books are important to democracy, not just reading or literacy, but actual physical books. And I don't know if I was right, but I, but I had an argument that if not clever, it was at least fun. And so I've been trying to turn it into a book. And somehow, whenever I travel and I talk about my future projects, booksellers always say, why don't you write that one next? That sounds like a really good book, say the booksellers. Uh, and, and so I, 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 and, and, and I think I may do that one. Um, we're trying to decide, um, my agent, my wife, and myself are talking about what I should do next, should I, for next year. Should I finish one of these novels? Should I do what everyone um, around me calls the book about books? Or should I do uh, something else? And, and I don't know which of those is going to come, uh, to come first. Those are my principal nonfiction projects at this time. Yes, sir, on the end. Does it create a conflict of interest? You asked if I'm a spiritual person. Um, I'm not sure how I can answer the question about being spiritual, that matter religious. I am a, I'm a committed Christian, um, and that does create certain conflicts, actually, in my writing. If you read my fiction, you will see that although there sometimes are bad words in there. <laughs> no, there are. Number one, I never read those words aloud when I'm reading. Number two, none of my characters ever take God's name in vain. I couldn't even write down a character taking the Lord's name in vain. I just... And it's not a matter of, oh, I just won't do that. I just, I just can't do it. If I were to try, I don't think that I, I couldn't get it uh, working. That's, that's a, a one kind of conflict. There's something else. There, there's, a, there's a big debate. Well, there has been a debate over the years among uh, committed Christians who are novelists about the extent to which their novels ought to, ought to be theologically correct or ought to be at least uplifting and uh, inspiring. And people have told me that on the inspiring point, mine have been going downhill. You know, they... <laughs> The first one was kind of uplifting. The second one, eh, and this one, oh man, you know. So, so I don't, I don't, uh, uh, so I don't know how that's um, if that's working out exactly the way that it's uh, uh, that it's supposed to. It's something that um, I spend a lot of time thinking about, uh, and that my wife and I actually spend a lot of time um, uh, talking about, and I spend time praying about um, uh, as well. It's a very, very important question, I think, especially when you have an audience. It, it's an important question to uh, uh, to ask. Now, where were we over here? Wait a minute. There was one I said I would get before, but I, it's gone. Okay, I'll get this one, that one, and this one. Okay, go ahead. What about the question of building literacy in this country? That's, that, well, I, I, I agree that literacy is important in the country, and, I, and, and for me and my wife, given the kind of work that we do, especially important in the African-American uh, uh, community, and um, I, I give these talks sometimes. I gave a talk at, at, a, at a black church um, uh, and, and talked about uh, some of the data about literacy and some of the ways in which we can either help our kids in the black community or stop unhelping them, you might say. And in particular, there's two pieces of data which, which a lot of people aren't familiar. Um, one is that, putting, put aside an issue of how much television children watch, um, there is a very strong negative correlation between school achievement and the number of hours the television is on in the household, even if the children aren't watching it and are, aren't listening to it, can't hear it. It turns out the more hours of television the parents watch, the less well children do in school. And African Americans are some of the highest consumers of television in the world, in the entire world. And so that's an example of a self-help thing that I've uh, been, I don't want to say preaching, but kind of preaching about um, for very, various audiences for a very, um, um, a, a very long time. The other thing is that, the other thing that's very helpful to building literacy uh, is the complexity of the conversations that children hear. To have complex conversations, you don't necessarily need people with a college education, but you need more than one adult. The interaction of adults, it's now believed by a lot of neuroscientists, cognitive neuroscientists, has an enormous effect on the complexity of the children's thought and their ability to uh, learn. And that's why it may make a big difference whether children are raised by one parent or two. It's not that there aren't a lot of courageous people out there who raise children alone. There are. And a lot of them do an incredible job under a lot of pressure. 
but the job will be easier the more that we're able to get children raised in a household with two adults. And I'm not expressing even what two adults they have to be. The point is that if the listen to adult conversation, those interactions between adults, as opposed because the way adults talk to children is a very narrow vocabulary. And the kids learn a lot more about listening to adults talk by listening to adults talk to each other than listening to adults talk to children. So those are two examples of the sorts of things that um, my wife and I kind of go around to our dog and pony show and uh, and uh, talk about. Then I started to get yours. I th wait. Uh oh. Lamaster Carla, yeah. Now, don't say anything about the end of the story now. Okay. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> Can you just, I, I, I think, I, I think it's good if we just stop here. <laughs> oh, you wonder if Master Carl is coming back. Well, um, um, hmm. well, all I can say, uh, I, I don't have anything to say at this point about Master Julia Carlyle is in this book as a little girl. Julia Carlyle, Lamaster's wife, who he asked about, is in this book as a little girl. By the way, you know who else is in this book? If you read the Ambrosian Park, Talcott. Misha Garland is in this book. Now, he's a little boy. He's in one scene. He's playing tag or, or hide and seek, and he's playing badly. But he's in. Uh, but he he has a he has a little cameo in this um, uh, in this story. There are some other characters from some of my other fiction who do turn up in here in their younger selves. Um, Oliver Garland, the judge, has a couple of small scenes. He's alive um, then, uh, obviously. Uh, his wife, uh, who. Um, is more of a cipher in uh, the first novel, is more developed here as well, although they're minor characters in the story. Mona Vesey, as I mentioned before, Julia Carlyle's mother from New England White, is an important character. She's not one of the leading characters, but she's a very important character for a variety of story reasons um, in this book. And also, if you read New England White, you've already met Aurelia, who I told you is one of the two lovers in this story, because there's one scene, which you may or may not remember if you read the novel, that takes place at the uh, at, at the annual Christmas dance of uh, the organization uh, Ladybugs that Julia is a member of, and there is a writer named Aurelia Tween who comes and talks to her during that. Well, that's this same Aurelia who we meet then when she's uh, younger. So there are some people that we meet early on. As to whether Lamaster and Alice is coming back, I have lots and lots of ideas that I've written down about various characters I might develop later, but I never know who I'm going to develop later until I have a story um, to fit them. The character, if I do another novel that you might say is like these, and I have some other ideas novels that are very unlike these that I'd like to pursue, but other ones like these, the character I'm most likely to pursue next is actually one who, if you're at the Ambrosian Park, you'll recognize maybe who it is, but I'm not going to tell anything about it because she only shows up in the second half of the novel. Uh, Maxine from the Ambrosian Park, um, if you don't remember who she is, that's fine, but anyway, Maxine from the Ambrosian Park is, I think, the one I'm most likely to, because that's the novel, among novels that are like, more like the ones I've written so far, um, she is the most fully developed character in the partly finished novels that are on my, uh, on my hard drive. Now, you've been very patient. Okay. I am a very avid reader. I read fiction, nonfiction, and I've read lots of fiction by the character of Peter Mountain. And he must be the most amazing author to make your interest. You can keep going. <laughs> you, 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 can, you, you get to make a speech. <laughs> Well, I appreciate that, but I, I but what I said before, oh, oh, you didn't get your question, I'm sorry. All right, well, give me the question and I'll. Actually, I have two questions. Okay, make them with this. Yeah, okay. Quick. Um, one question, I just started this, and I wonder if Eddie is getting some advice. And what's the other question? I'll, tell, I'll answer both of them at the same time. Where do we get the names? And, and is Eddie on the As the first part of what he said, let me just say one thing, which is that 
I continue to be very grateful for the very nice things people have said about these novels. I really am just trying to entertain. I'm not trying to do any more than that. And people find all these resonances and ideas, and that's great, but maybe they're your ideas, you know, that, that, that are and not mine and that, that are so attractive, I don't know. As to those two characters, is, is Eddie anything like me? Well, I don't think that he is, but I always think that about my characters. People are always saying, oh, so and so is like you. I think, you know, every novelist um, is, in a sense, we invent these things out of our own heads, and so uh, no doubt there are if, if characters are not animated by the same forces that animate us, we're bound to see faint echoes in the bad characters as well as the good ones in many, many cases. But Eddie's not consciously designed around me um, uh, at all. And in fact, I think in many ways, um, he's very um, unlike me, at least I hope so, um, as you'll see as, as you read on. Um, where do I get the names from? Um, someone asked earlier about uh, people whose writings influenced me. And I want to mention two writers very different who have influenced me, um, which is an important answer to your question, and that's uh, James Baldwin and, and Charles Dickens. Uh, very, very different writers, uh, but they both influenced me. Uh, why Baldwin? Baldwin because, um, I mean, now Baldwin, now when I say influence, I'm not in a class with these. These are geniuses. I'm not in a class with them. But, but Baldwin, in his fiction and also in his essays, what crackles from the page is his sense Sometimes he's described as someone who believes in human weakness. That's not right. It, it's human passion. He sees us as bundles of passion that every day for Baldwin is a battle between the passions we feel and our desire to master them. And, he, and he's also falsely accused, I think, of saying we can never master our passions. That's not true. He thinks we can't master all of our passions. And you've got to, in effect, decide which ones to master and which ones to let go and, and give vent to. And that led him to develop enormous complexity, I think, in his characters. And you can see it across all his fiction. Although I think the best example is probably what I think is his best novel, which is Go Tell of the Mountain. Other people may think others are better, but I think that's really I think one of the classics of 20th century American literature. And, and, but if you read any of them, that's, that passion is what crackles. And so what I, I take from that is a sense of the necessary complexity that all of us have something in us we have to tame as well as something else we have to let out, and our intellect and reason should help us guide, guide us as to which is which. Dickens is the more direct answer to your question. Um, nobody reads Dickens for the plot, right? You don't read, no, you don't read Bleak House because, wow, I wonder how it ends. You know, that's, that's not what, you, well, oh, all right, I shouldn't say that. Very few people read Dickens for the plot. Let me, let me, let me change that. Um, you read Dickens for the beauty of the characterizations. In particular, he loves his characters. He adores them, and no matter how minor they are, they all get three or four pages and kind of come dancing through the story and show off, and you get their cadence of their voice and these remarkable names. He kind of, I don't know how he does it. Um, and, uh, and, and so I take from that a real love of character. I really adore my characters, and I do spend, sometimes names just come to me, and sometimes um, I spend a lot of time uh, working out uh, uh, the names. A few of the names have hidden significances. Most of them don't. A few of them do. In my novel, The Ronald White, for example, as from what I can tell, not a single reviewer noticed, much to my chagrin, <laughs> that except for Julia Carlyle, who shares the last name of a famous humanist writer, that every single person associated with the Divinity School, from the dean to the professors to the students to the librarian, has the last name of a famous physicist. <laughs> now, that, every single one, that was intended as a joke. <laughs> that is why I probably do not write humor novels because I guess people didn't get it. It wasn't it wasn't really properly uh, uh, done. So that was one way. That's the example of having a lot of fun um, with uh, uh, with the names. Other names, um, just like Lamaster Carlyle. Uh, people ask me, was I playing consciously on the idea of master? And it's just not initially, but eventually, I did get the cadence of that, which I have. Byron Dennison, another character novel, calling him the little master um, later on in the story, and uh, uh, and so on. I do have a lot of fun, and I I, I love Aurelia's name. That's such a that, that I, I wanted a name that would flow trippingly off the tongue uh, for her, and Aurelia uh, just came to me as as the name, um, and so that's how I, I came up with her first name. People ask me how to come up with the last name, which is Treen, Aurelia Treen, because Treen doesn't flow trippingly off the tongue, and I actually don't remember. I don't know the answer to that, but uh, but I do think both names came to me uh, together. Okay, yes, sir, and then I'll get yours. And there was one over there before that. Yes.
Yes. <laughs> I do. What's the question? <laughs> um, probably not. Um, I, uh, once you start talking about religion and politics, it's really hard to sell books. You know, that's, that's, the, that's, that's the thing. Um, so what I... <laughs> So what I'm going to do is, I'm actually writing something about that, and I'll, I'm going to save it. To, I'm writing a little essay uh, about that, and I'll save it. To, the essay should come out in, in a month or so, and I'll probably I'll save it till uh, uh, to that. It's not. It's, I think it's a very important um, uh, question, but it's one I'd rather defer on for the uh, uh, for the. Mm -hmm. It will be well. It's one of two. It'll either be in the Huffington Post or in the Washington Post. Interesting. I have to. I owe each of them an essay, and it'll be one of those two. Um, so, you know, if you're like me and you read maybe mainly newspapers, then, then, it's in, then you want to look in the Washington Post. But, you know, if you're with it, then you want to like, <laughs> look in the Huffington Post. I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> anyway. Um, okay. There was a question. Yes. You, wait, what? Bef I said before there was one. Someone over there before. No. Okay. Go ahead. My wife. <laughs> no, um, well, you know, the, the truth is, there, there are a lot, a lot of authors of more serious literature, there's a lot of male authors of more serious literature than this, will tell you in a minute um, that writing women is more interesting than writing men. Um, and I don't know exactly how they mean it, but, but it's a very common comment that you hear from male authors who write sort of series, you know, Pulitzer Prize type stuff. But I, so I write thrillers, but I find that to be true also. I, I just find, I don't know why it is, but I find um, female characters more interesting. Uh, and uh, that's why I especially enjoyed, uh, when I was writing New England White, which is told mostly from the point of view of Julia Carlyle, that was not the original intention. Originally it was going to be the, the third, typical third person narrator with a lot of different points of view, but as the story evolved, more and more of the action started running through Julia, and it just seemed to make sense after a while that she would be the person who told most of the story. Here, however, this is different because here I had the character of Aurelia long before I had the character of Eddie. And I knew half the book was going to be Aurelia's book. Um, even when I didn't have a, an entire uh, story. But, uh, but I do agree that, uh, especially when you write thrillers, a lot of the female characters are, as I say, are, are fluff. Um, there's a formula. Uh, if, if you follow the so-called, you know, the Ludlum formula people used to talk about, you know, so you've got this guy and he knows the truth and nobody believes him, and the bad guys want to kill him, and the good guys want to put him in jail, and he runs, and there's always a woman who shows up just not to help him, falls madly in love with him in the first day, nearly dies in the next chapter, but he saves her life, and they go off together, and they solve the mystery, and the world is saved from whatever. And, and that's a formula. A lot of people write that kind of novel, and some of those novels are fun to read. But that's not enough heft for me in the, f or by the way, not the male characters either, I might add. Um, I don't know. I, I, I honestly don't know the answer. You asked me that a lot. I, I enjoy writing female characters. I work very hard at it. People tell, ask me, is it hard to do it because you're a guy? And it is, but, but, but every novel, if you're serious about your craft, is an act of invention. Every point of view of an author is an act of invention. People assume since the first novel was told from the point of view of a male law professor, it must have been easy. It must be me. But I, don't, I, I really hope I'm not like Misha Garland. I didn't, I didn't find him a likable person. Um, and I didn't like the way he talked about his wife. I, I really, I, I mean, I, I know that sounds like an odd thing to say since I wrote the novel, but I really felt <laughs> as time went on, the way he talked about his wife was getting on my nerves, which is why she shows up again. <laughs> it's true. That's why she shows up again in um, New England White, where she has a couple of scenes, because I wanted readers to see her through the eye of some of her female friends who liked her to get a different picture of who, uh, of who she was. Now, where are we? I'll get yours and then yours. Oh. Yes, go ahead. Oh, any interest in politics? You me? <laughs> well, no, no interest and no relevant skills uh, or anything like that um, uh, either. And don't get me wrong, I'm not 
um, cynical about politicians. I do think it's a very high calling, but I think you have to be called to it. I, I, I think that, that – um, and again, this is across the spectrum. I, I think you've got to do it not because it's great to have power or even because it's great to accomplish some ideological goal because it's great to serve the public. Um, it, it, or to serve the country. I think that's really what has to be to be the the uh, call. And some people have that call and have the relevant um, skills. No, I'm happy doing um, what I'm doing. And over the years, I've had many opportunities to leave Yale and do other things. But I'm happy being a law professor and I'm happy writing novels. And I assume that's what I'll do until I'm ready to uh, retire or unless God takes me from this earth earlier than that. I mean, that's what I enjoy doing. And I, I can't imagine something else I'd be happier um, uh, Two more questions. All right, nice. How to get yours? Yes. You mean give my handsome profile? <laughs> um, have a question. You mean about the books? Well, yeah. I mean, but but you have to understand what happens is, you know, um, studios come along and they buy the rights to your books, but then it's all a black box because Hollywood buys far more um, material. Than including books they could ever make into. Uh, I, I don't understand how anybody makes money out there, by the way. They, they, they pay money for books they're never going to make in the movies and for a lot of other things. You know, there are, Holly, there are screenwriters in Hollywood who earn millions of dollars a year who have never had a movie made from their screen, screenplays. It's, it's a true story. It's a story about the New York Times a, a year or two ago. Um, but they're considered wonderful screenwriters and they keep getting hired and writing all these screenplays. Um, and minimum scale for screenplay is $250,000. Although I think it might have just been raised, and so they write at minimum scale or more, and they just, you know, so I don't know. Um, but yeah, there we have a couple of deals, and we're working on another one. But making a deal is very different from getting a movie made. Getting a movie made is not something I know anything about. Um, I've never believed that the movie has to reflect a book. It's a different medium. Um, it's an effort to say, given this rough idea and these rough characters and this rough stories, there's something I could do with this medium to make that an attractive and powerful story that people will pay to see and buy lots of popcorn and, 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 and so on. And I don't know anything about that world. Um, it's exciting when people in that world are interested in the little worlds that I create, but it's not a world that I myself know much, um, uh, know much uh, about. So last question, way in the back there. Yes? Well, then I don't have an answer. Do I see this election as a watershed for the Supreme Court? Well, I, I, always, I see the Supreme Court as always being overplayed. So, you know, I'm, not, I'm not a big I – mean, I, I teach – when I teach constitutional law, I tell people the first thing you have to understand is the Supreme Court's not very important. But that's a story – that's something I've written about a lot over the years. I don't want to get into that now. The Supreme Court has a mainly symbolic value in American politics, and the image of it as the great maker of trend is a little bit overblown. If you look at – the court rarely creates a trend that usually is in the middle of one. It may accelerate one. It may slow it down, but it's rarely the creator or the – Break at least that's what history teaches us. But that's a story for another uh, uh, for another day. Um, politics is something that I think I, I leave mainly to people who are very passionate uh, about it. As a scholar, I prefer to observe it, uh, and uh, and it's fun uh, uh, and exciting to observe politics in a democracy. Uh, thank you all very much for your kind attention. Thank you.